This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. I'm Sophie Ikenye. Our top story tonight is a special report into the drug Nyaupe. Our investigations unit looks at its impact on thousands of young lives in South Africa. I feel like you are literally dying. At some point when you're like that, you end up doing some very, very awful things. Also in the program, we'll be live with Peter Okoche in Nigeria ahead of the elections as lawmakers in Abuja protest against the recent suspension of the country's chief justice. And in sport, this summer's Africa Cup of Nations start date has been pushed back. Find out why. Thanks for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. We begin with a special report from our investigations unit, BBC Africa Eye, into the deadly drug cocktail, Nyaupe, and its effects on thousands of young lives in South Africa's townships. It's heroin-based often mixed with antiretroviral drugs and even rat poison. Now, most of its users are young, unemployed men from poor backgrounds. Our reporter, Golden Mtika, tracked down one of the shadowy drug dealers uh, involved and met one of its many victims. Yelpa is costing my wife, is costing my child, is costing me everything. My name is Gordon Ntika. I'm a crime reporter in Johannesburg, South Africa. In the space of five years, I lost my twin nephews, Innocent and Enoch, to Nyaopi. Nyaopi is a highly addictive heroin-based narcotic, which sometimes contains HIV medication. It's often mixed with marijuana and smoked or injected. This is a story of a drug epidemic across South Africa, fueled by corruption. I've come in search of answers. In the crowd, I spot one of my nephew's old friends. Jesus came from a good home and was always immaculately dressed. I can't believe how far he's fallen. After what happened to my nephews, I'm determined to help Jesus escape his addiction. I find him scavenging in an open sewer. Hey, in the morning, it's hell, man. I feel like you are literally dying. At some point when you're like that, you end up doing some very, very awful things. <laughs> How are you feeling? Oh, hey. I feel so relieved right now after having this pool, you know. Now I'm relaxed, you know. It's hard seeing just how low Jesus has fallen. The pain feels like it's going to take out your soul, you know. Jesus has a son he hasn't seen for a long time, and I wonder if that could motivate him. Would it be OK with you? Yeah. If we can ask the rehab to uh, get you a place there. I'd love that. Get to sit with my light here again, bro. A few days later, the rehab center has agreed to take Jesus, but I need to get him to the center before his cravings begin. Joseph is a former Nyaobe addict who mentors new arrivals. Jesus has been addicted to Nyaobe for almost a decade. He will be kept under lock and key until he's clean. The next day, I returned to see how Jesus is doing. Oh, hey, Shana, buddy, hey. Right now, I'm feeling hot and cold. Hot and cold, hot and cold. You wanna sleep, you can't sleep. It's tiring your body. It's making your whole body uncomfortable. I'm gonna beat you this game. It's not gonna beat me. Thousands of young South Africans are in exactly the same situation as Jesus. But who are the shadowy people responsible for flooding our townships with the drug? 
I've managed to find a Nyawope trafficker who's willing to talk to me. What has God to us? For children to come and buy drugs from you and smoke, we don't feel fine for different things. How do you deal with the cops? We deal with them, they know it's a business. They're so hustling. No rank officer take bribe. High rank officer, they take bribe. The cops know all the dealers. There's no dealers the cops doesn't know. I've managed to find a cop who's prepared to talk about corrupt officers who are feeding off the drug trade. I'm meeting him at a secret location. I'm trying to combat crime and protect members of the community. But some of our members, they are taking bribes to those who supply Nyaupe. How could the corruption be stopped? To stop corruption, arrest those police officers who's involved in crime. We put these allegations to the South African Police Service. In response, they highlighted recent high-profile arrests of drug dealers in the Johannesburg area. It's been six months since I left Jesus in rehab. Hi, Jesus. Hey, hi, man. You're looking clean, man. Yeah. You're looking very clean, eh? Yeah. Very neat. Sure. <laughs> hey, you're looking, just look at you, man. I can't believe this is you, man. You're looking great, man. Yeah. The hardest part was my first three days in the first week. Go. Oh. <laughs> there's pains, there's sleepless nights, you know. <laughs> I'm finding it hard to put words to it, because even the thought of it is like, yo, my God, I wouldn't go back to that ever again. I'm taking him home to meet his family for the first time in years. Yeah, it feels very good, actually. Oh, it feels very, very good. <laughs> Coco. <laughs> I'm going to cry for real because, hey, I've been missing my mom. I've been missing my mother. I'm very, very happy. He's my first son. <laughs> Jesus is back on the streets, this time spreading the message to Nyaobi addicts that the drug can be beaten. Well, let's bring in the head of South Africa's Central Drug Authority, David Mayeva, Bayeva. He joins us from Johannesburg. Thanks for taking time to talk to us. We've heard Jesus there now is cleaned up. But how serious is this problem of uh, Nyaope in South Africa in terms of figures? Good evening, and to your listeners as well. Uh, the problem is a very, very big problem, and it is very, very difficult for us to be able to deal with it. One of the biggest problems, of course, is that we don't exactly know what the actual quantum amount is of people that are using the drug because it's very, very difficult to do statistics on people who don't come forward for help. So we are really only knowing what the tip of the iceberg is looking like and we're not sure about how many more people we need to reach out to. What's been your biggest impediment when it comes to tackling illicit drug use or even illicit drugs really in South Africa? I think one of the biggest problems that we've got is that South Africa has been identified by the drug cartels as a transit route. And unfortunately, when the drugs arrived in South Africa en route to whichever destination they were meant for, they found a ready market here in South Africa as well, which is part of the bigger problem that we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. They found that there were people that were dependent on making money for themselves using crime. And this was one of the easiest ways to make money by selling or dealing in drugs. The reason for that is because of the unemployment situation that they found themselves in, the level of despondency that our youth have in terms of their opportunities going forward. And this is what has created a big problem for us in having to deal with the problem of substance abuse as well. All right, so, so you know what the problem is. What are you doing to tackle it? Well, there are a number of different issues that we're looking at. And firstly, what we had to do is we had to recognize that this is, as much as anything else, a health issue that needs to be dealt with in terms of the problem that it creates, particularly with people who are injecting drugs and blood-borne diseases that are then transferred as well. 
the hepatitis C epidemic that is going to possibly hit us and will be another problem that we're going to have to deal with as big as what the HIV was. So we are looking at it now from a health perspective. We're also recognizing that there was the need for social departments to, to get more involved in terms of creating skills, opportunities for people to be able to deal with the problems that they find themselves in. We also recognize that gangsterism and the peer pressure associated with that is another issue that has to be dealt with. And all of these have been dealt with by government. Our South African police have created an anti-unit for gangsterism. Our health department have opened up opioid substitution therapy treatment facilities for people who are addicted to drugs, and particularly the opioids. And the social development have also introduced a number of uh, programs, particularly aimed at learners in school and helping them to develop the necessary skills. Mm, so some measures have been put in place so far. Thank you very much indeed for taking time to talk to us on Focus on Africa. David B. over there. Thank you. Well, let's now take a quick look at other stories making headlines across Africa. Zimbabwe's president has ordered the arrest of members of the security forces who were caught on camera beating up a young man they had arrested. Emerson Mnangagwa said he was appalled by what he had seen in the report. It showed the man in handcuffs being pulled from a van and repeatedly beaten around the head. Now, Egypt's president, Abdul Fattah al-Sisi, has defended his country's human rights status during a joint TV news conference with the French president, Emmanuel Macron. He said the issue should be taken in the context of regional turbulence and the fight against terrorism. Mr. Macron said a dialogue on human rights is both necessary and appropriate. Sudan's president, Omar el-Bashir, has extended a unilateral ceasefire with rebels in the country's conflict-hit regions until peace is achieved in the areas. He spoke at a rally today in Kadugli, that's the capital of South Kordofan state, ravaged by a deadly conflict between government forces and rebels since 2011. Now, his announcement comes as deadly protests rocked the country, triggered by a government decision to raise the price of bread. Did Nigeria's president breach the constitution? There's a huge debate right now in the country over the decision by President Muhammadu Buhari to suspend the country's chief justice. Walter Onohen was suspended on Friday over allegations that he failed to declare his assets before taking up post in 2017. Today, hundreds of lawyers have taken to the streets of Abuja in protest against the move. Well, Peter Okoche is in Nigeria for us. Uh, on, uh, on the election coverage. Uh, yeah, Peter, what's been happening? What's going on there? Well, Sophia, I arrived to a, a very, very divided Nigeria. Uh, divided some on the part of the president and others with the opposition over the suspension of the Chief Justice Walter Onohen. Now, President uh, Mohamed Buhari says he has acted uh, in suspending the Chief Justice, he's acted in accordance with a request from the Code of Conduct uh, Tribunal, which is set up to investigate uh, uh, senior people in the civil service. But those who are opposed to the suspension of the, um, of the Chief Justice, uh, and those who are opposed include the main opposition, PDP, they say what President Buhari has effectively done is to suspend the constitution. They said the case should have gone to, the, to a national judicial council as well as to the houses of parliament, the two national houses of parliament. Well, as you mentioned, hundreds of lawyers took to the streets today. And just as I said, Nigeria is divided. And those lawyers were divided today too when they gathered in front of the headquarters of the Nigerian Bar Association. Some of them in support of President Mohamed Buhari, others against what uh, they say is a suspension of the constitution. Well, one man who's also had his say is the Nigerian Senate president, Bukola Saraki. Now, he's the number three man in the country. I caught up with him earlier today and asked for his opinion on the matter. Well, I've spoken and uh, made my views known that um, I, I don't believe that any way in the constitution that the president has the powers to do that. It's very unconstitutional. Um, the timing of it is wrong and it sends a wrong signal. It's a great danger to the, our democracy and our forthcoming election. 
in, in, so in all aspects of it, it is wrong. The presidency says this is just a suspension. I mean, if someone has, has allegations against him, you know, and he's suspended so that investigations can take place, surely that's due process as well? No, but the constitution says how that can be done. Um, it says you, there's the NJC and also the National Assembly, particularly the Senate, has a role to play. Um, as, as nobody is against the fight against corruption. That we, it's important that we do that, but we must do it at the level of due process. Uh, and, and we must ensure uh, that, that we must respect the Constitution all the time. And, and we are a democratic country and we must be seen to do, follow due process. Mr. Senate President, I mean, some people will find it ironic that you are taking this such a stand. I mean, when you were governor of your state, you also sacked a chief no, justice. No, of the state. no, I didn't. You I did. didn't. Well, no, the, state, no, no, the, state, the state assembly, well, it went to the state assembly, and it says anyway, by two thirds did that. I didn't do that. It was recommended to the state assembly. I didn't. I mean, that, uh, when we hear a lot of that, that's just propaganda to try and, you know, uh, model the waters. The issue really is that. In our own case, it was sent to the State Assembly and they played their role in line with the Constitution. Um, so that's just, just totally different. I'm sure you can deduce from um, what he said there, Bukwala Saraki, the Nigerian Senate President, that he is a member of the opposition. All this is happening uh, just a few weeks before the presidential elections on the 16th of February. They say they, the, the, the Chief Justice was sacked because he was going to uh, constitute an electoral commission which would not favor President Mohamed Buhari. But while leaving his house this morning, I saw a lot of people gathering, and I have been told that both houses of parliament, the Senate and the lower house, are, are having an emergency meeting tomorrow to discuss the matter. Whatever comes out of it, we'll bring it to you here on Focus on Africa. Sophie. All right, indeed. Peter Okoche for us there in Abuja. Thank you. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Still to come, Domestic League football returns to Sierra Leone. We'll have more after the break with Mimi. I'm Sophie Ikenye and you're watching Focus on Africa from BBC World News. The top story on this program, the BBC's Africa Eye Investigations Unit has revealed how some police in South Africa have been bribed by drug guns, gangs in the country's townships. Two people have been arrested in southwest Tanzania in connection with the killing of six children in the past few weeks. The children, aged between three to six years, had some of their organs chopped off. Authorities believe the killings are ritualistic and have ordered proper investigations. Beryl Munoko has a story. These archaeology students are trying to piece together the broken parts of what are known as the wonders of Algeria. Gently, they use water and brushes, spending hours to clean stone engraved symbols on the pyramid tombs that are centuries old. We are cleaning the symbols so that they can be seen better, that we will measure the stones and symbols. But they are not experts, which is why Algerian authorities want the site to be... Well, apology, apologies for that report. Not the correct one. We'll try and bring you the right one, if we can, as soon as we can. But for now, you're watching BBC Focus on Africa. Let's uh, find out what's happening in the world of sport, Mimi. Thank you very much, Sophie. Now we begin in football with just over five months to go to this summer's Africa Cup of Nations. And it's been announced that the tournament dates have been pushed back by a week. That's to allow their Muslim players to rest after the holy month of Ramadan. The four week long tournament will now start on the 21st of June instead of the original date of the 15th of June. And the final will take place on the 19th of July. The draw for the competition will be held on the 12th of April in Cairo. So staying with football, we knew that it was going to take place in Qatar, but we didn't know the date yet. Well, now the Confederation of African Football have picked the 29th of March as the date for the Super Cup, which will be held in Doha. It's the first time that it will be played outside Africa. Meanwhile, Moroccan side Raja Casablanca will have to look for a new coach for that Super Cup match against Tunisia's Esperance after sacking Juan Carlos Garrido. And on Sunday, domestic league football returned to Sierra Leone after a four and a half year absence. 
The opening day saw a colorful ceremony attended by tens of thousands of fans, including a special guest, the country's president, sports journalist Mohamed Fajr Bari, with more. Despite the country is currently being suspended by world football's governing body, FIFA, the long break was largely due to internal wranglings in the Sierra Leone Football Association, as well as the outbreak of deadly Ebola virus disease in the West African country a few years ago, which killed thousands of people. 13 teams are participating in the two rounds league scheduled to end in July. The opening match on Sunday was between the two highest crowd pulling teams in Sierra Leone, Mighty Blackpool and Eastern Lions, who won 1 0. The attendance was massive, as there were tens of thousands of Sierra Leoneans at the Shaka Stevens Stadium, which was full beyond its 35,000 capacity. The attendance was the highest in Sierra Leone for a league match in almost three decades. President Julius Madabio, whose government is providing over $400,000 to run the league, was in attendance. As the transfer window is drawing to a close this week, amongst one of the big names on the move is Bakari Sako. Crystal Palace have re-signed the Mali International from West Bromwich Albion until the end of the season. And veteran Ivory Coast midfielder Seri Die has joined struggling Swiss side Neuchatel, Zamax on loan from FC Basel until the end of the season. More in African football transfers, Everton have turned down an offer from French Champions League Paris Saint-Germain for their Senegalese midfielder Idrissa Ghana Gay. Reports say that an offer of $28 million was put forward, but under pressure manager Marco Silva is not willing to part ways with the 29-year-old. And finally, the 30th edition of the International Marathon of Marrakesh was held on Sunday. It was a race dominated by Ethiopia. In the men's category, Fikadu Jirma Teferi won the race. And in the women's, his countrywoman Ethiopia's Seudu Esefa Mulunesh took the title. And that's all the sport for now. Sophie. It's very interesting, the Sierra Leone uh, League. It's, uh, how many years has it been now? Over four years, actually. Well, what was the issue exactly, and how, how did they resolve this? Well, they had issues going on with the Sierra Leone Football Association, mm -hmm. as well as Ebola outbreaks. So that affected, of course, the league from starting. But more is going to develop from the story, because there is a FIFA ban in place. So it'll be interesting to see how it's all going to develop. And of course, there's also the breaking story just, becoming, just coming in of Kalusha Bwalia, the Zambian football legend. FIFA have reduced his two-year ban. Wow, okay, right. Thank you for the sport, Mimi. Thank you. Right. Now, our special report today from BBC Africa. I looked into the deadly drug cocktail, Nyaupe, and its effects on thousands of young lives in South Africa's townships. It's heroin-based, often mixed with antiretroviral drugs and even rat poison. Most of its users are young, unemployed men from poor backgrounds. Now, the superhero film Black Panther has won the top prize at the Screen Actors Guild Awards in Los Angeles. The film, which depicts a futuristic African society, picked up the award for outstanding performance by a cast, Chadwick Boseman, who played the lead role, said black actors frequently faced disappointment, but the cast knew they had something special that they wanted to give the world. Well, don't forget you can get in touch with me and the rest of the team on Twitter. I'm at CKNU. For now, thank you for your company.